everyone, welcome to today's LACNIS webinar, Clinical Trials, the Latest and Greatest in Med, with Dr. Armand Chohan. I'm Lindsay Judavine, the Director of Communications for LACNIS, and this is... I'm Lisa Yen, I'm the Program Director for LACNIS. Before we get started today, I'd like to thank Rich at TVP Live for making today's webinar and high quality production possible. You're the best, Rich. Also, please remember we will be having a live Q&A following Dr. Chohan's presentation. So to submit your non-case specific questions, please go to www.slido.com and enter the event code LACNETS5. That's L-A-C-N-E-T-S-5. And here are a few tech tips for today, some reminders. Please be sure your volume is on, all, all the way up on your computer. You can double check if the volume is unmuted on the webinar broadcast screen. For your video, you can enlarge the webinar broadcast screen by clicking the expand screen button in the bottom right corner. Also, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and can be viewed on our YouTube channel shortly after the live broadcast. Our YouTube channel consists of a video library of 100 plus net videos. And be sure you're following LACNETS on social media. You can find us on our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the handle at LACNETS. As a reminder, these webinars are done for educational purposes only and do not substitute for medical advice. Please talk to your medical team if you have any questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. We all have our own opinions and these are our own opinions. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of LACNETS. And now I'll pass it off to you, Lisa. Thank you, Lindsay. As you know, LACNETS is a program by generatepossibility.org, a registered nonprofit and LACNETS stands for the Los Angeles Carcinoid Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. Our mission is to provide education, advocacy, and support for all people impacted by this rare disease that used to be known as carcinoid, an old term meaning cancer-like. The more accurate term is neuroendocrine tumor, or NET for short. You'll often hear us say neuroendocrine cancer since we understand NET is a type of cancer and not cancer-like or benign as previously thought. While you often see Lindsay and I leading the meetings and programs, we are in fact led by a team which includes our interim administrator and board member Kavya Velagaputi and board member Donna Gavin, who is also the sister of Lactance founder and executive director emeritus Giovanna Joyce and Basie. Our newest board member is Mary Dunleavy, who is living and thriving with NET. I'm excited to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Aman Chohan. Dr. Chohan is a board-certified medical oncologist at the University of Kentucky's Marquis Cancer Center. He completed a dual residency in both internal medicine and pediatrics at Louisiana State University in New Orleans. His clinical interests include the treatment of NETs, including carcinoid tumors, high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas, and small cell carcinoma, and he identifies NET patients who qualify for PRT treatments for NETs. He is leading multiple NET phase one and two clinical trials. It's clear that Dr. Chohan is very committed to helping the NET community. I first heard Dr. Chohan speak at NANETS, the medical professional conference back in October, 2019, which was the last time we were able to meet in person and everyone was fascinated by his work. He will talk a little bit more about that work today. Dr. Chohan's passion is palpable and his excitement contagious. We're very excited to welcome today, Dr. Aman Chohan. Good morning, everybody. My name is Aman Chohan. I'm one of the medical oncologists at University of Kentucky, and I direct our neuroendocrine tumor diagnostic program. Today, I would be talking about some exciting clinical trials in neuroendocrine tumors, and I'm excited to be here with LACNETS discussing these cutting edge clinical trials uh, in pipeline. These are some of my disclosures. Before I delve into my presentation, let me ask a very uh, basic question. How do we go about improving standard of care of treatments? The answer is clinical trials. The clinical trials are research studies that involves humans, especially human patients, 
and for today's purposes, we are talking about cancer patients. Through clinical trials, we find new ways to improve treatments and to improve quality of life for our patients. Lastly, clinical trials is the final step in a long process that begins in a research lab after years and years of experimentations. Just very briefly, clinical trials of various types. Broadly, there are four phases of clinical trials. Phase one clinical trials are usually first in humans, early stage studies, where we are trying to figure out if the experimental drug can be safely given in humans and what would be the right dose of that drug. Phase two study is a little bit bigger study. We have already figured out the safe dose in human patients. However, now the goal is to see whether the drug really works. Does it have any anti-tumor activity? Phase three study compares this drug, which has been now tested in phase one and phase two setting in most cases, and compares and pits it against the current standard of care. Remember, our eventual goal is to improve the current standard of care. And most of the phase three studies compared the drug to a control group or the current standard of care and tried to outdo it. And lastly, there are four phase four studies. These are basically post-approval studies to continue to learn after the drug has been approved and is currently used in community to see if there are any safety, new safety signals and how the patients are doing with those approved drugs. Let me give some examples of the recent FDA approved drugs for neuroendocrine cancers and then this would all make sense. One of the drugs that we currently use in the management of neuroendocrine tumors called Affinitor or Evrolimus was studied in a large international phase three study called Radiant 4 study. Dr. James Yao was the principal investigator of this large study. And what they found out in this Radiant 4 study is the patient who got Affinitor or Evrolimus were able to keep their tumor stable for much longer as compared to placebo arm. You can see the difference was 11 months in treatment arm versus about four months in the control group. Based on these findings, FDA approved Affinitor for neuroendocrine tumors in mid-gut, pancreas, as well as lung neuroendocrine tumors. Prior to Radiant 4, Affinitor was only approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So these trials, they change standard of care and make effective drugs available to our patients who benefit from them. The other example I'd like to go over is a drug called telitrostat ethyl, also known as Zermelo. You've probably heard about this drug. This drug was studied in a large international randomized control trial called Telistar study. And what they found out, the patients who had carcinoid syndrome, diarrhea, not responding to somatostatin analog. The patients who received this drug had a significant reduction in their carcinoid syndrome, diarrhea, as compared to the patient who was receiving placebo. Based on these findings, the FDA finally approved this, and now we have access to this really wonderful drug, which can help with the symptom, especially carcinoid syndrome, diarrhea, which is not responding to the current standard of care somatostatin analogs. And lastly, the drug which most of you have probably heard of is Lutathera. This drug was studied in another international large phase three randomized control trial called NETR1. This drug called Lutathera or Lutetium-177 dotatate was studied against a control arm of high dose somatostatin analog mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor patients were progressing on the standard of care regimens were randomized. Some of them got Lutathera while the other got the control arm. And as you can see, by the time when this study was published in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, the study patients did not even reach the median PFS, whereas the control arm had median PFS of just 8.5 months. Now we know the median PFS for patients who are in the PRRT arm is close to about 30, 35 months. And that has been our observation 
from the previous European uh, studies as well. So this drug works, but it needed a good phase three clinical trial for us to confirm the efficacy. And this led to FDA approving this agent for metastatic gastroenteropancreatic neuronicin tumor. This is one of our patients from Markey Cancer Center. And as you can see, the image on the left hand side is a gallium dotatate scan on a metastatic neuronicin tumor patient. There's hardly any bone in the body left spared of the metastatic disease. After four doses of Lutathera, significant improvement in metastatic burden, about 63% to be precise, reduction in the tumor binding index or molecular tumor volume, but most importantly, significant improvement in quality of life and reduction in the pain. So these drugs are not only um, helping patients live longer, stabilizing their disease for much longer, but also improving quality of life, all very important in disease. However, for today's talk, let's discuss some key clinical trials that are currently happening in neuroendocrine tumor field. Those studies which might lead to new standard of cares and those which are very early in the development but have potential to significantly alter how we treat neuroendocrine tumor patients in the years to come. So I've divided the studies or um, the presentation into two segments, very early phase trials which are in phase one or phase two setting and the late phase studies, phase three studies, which are uh, hopefully, if are positive, can change standard of care in the near future. Let's start off with some key phase two, phase three studies, which if positive, can actually make an impact in the near future, in the way we treat neuronic tumor patients. And the three pick of the studies, which I feel are, could be a game changers if they are positive, are cabinet phase three study, compete phase three study, and the netter P study. Let's start off with Dr. Jennifer Chan's cabinet study. This is a large phase three randomized control study using a drug called cabozantinib. You might have heard about this drug. This drug is already being tested in various clinical trials, various tumors, and is now also FDA approved for certain cancers, but is not approved for neuroendocrine tumors yet. Dr. Jennifer Chen from Dana-Farber studied this drug in neuroendocrine tumor patients in phase two study and found to be very effective in controlling tumors. So the automatic next step was to confirm the activity in a phase three study, and if this study turns out to be positive, this might lead to an FDA approval in future. We eagerly await for this study to complete accrual. Um, this study is open in various cancer centers in the country, including Markey Cancer Center at University of Kentucky. A uh, very, very important study, and we are eagerly awaiting for it to complete accrual and to read it out. Just a small word about this drug, carbozantinib is tyrosine kinase inhibitor and it controls the tumor growth by inhibiting the new blood vessel formation in neuroendocrine tumors. As you all know, neuroendocrine tumors are very vascular cancers. One of the ways by which they grow is by developing new blood vessels which enhance their growing capacity. This is just one way by which VEGF inhibition or targeting new blood vessel formation affects tumor growth. Carbozantinib also works on tumor growth by attacking various other oncogenic pathways. So uh, the drug works uh, and is currently under evaluation. The other very important study that I'd like to highlight today is a phase three PRRT study called COMPETE. It's an international multicenter clinical trial, again, open in various European sites uh, and the U.S. sites, including our center at University of Kentucky at Markey. So in this particular study, we are looking for activity of new PRT agent and comparing it to the current standard of care, Affinitor. 
as you all know neuroendocrine tumors are a little bit unique in the sense that they express somatostatin receptors on its surface consider somatostatin receptor like a lock and a somatostatin analog like a key so the key likes to go and fit on in the lock similarly somatostatin analogs likes to go and sit on somatostatin receptor now if we can attach a radiation molecule or radioisotope to this somatostatin analog or the key when the key attaches to the lock it takes the radiation radionuclide uh, metal heavy metal with it and and that would then cause the radiation damage specifically to just the tumors that's the mechanism of action of how PRRT agent works and how we target uh, neuroendocrine tumors with that principle. So the study schema is pretty straightforward. The patients either get the PRRT agent or lutetium-177 edotriotide or they would get the current standard of care Affinitor. I like this study design because patient would either way get an active drug. They're not going to be getting a placebo. Having said that, placebo control studies have its own merit and own place in drug development. However, if a patient is progressing and, and we are evaluating a treatment early in uh, sequencing, it's probably better to have study drug compared to an active compound. So I really like that about uh, the complete study design. So patient either get four infusion of PRRT every three months or are randomized into Affinitor, which is an oral pill, and patient takes it every day. And the study is looking at how long would this intervention keep the tumors under check so we are looking at median PFS as the main endpoint. Besides that, the study would also look at the safety signals, how they compare in terms of side effect profile and other things. And lastly, among the third study, which can potentially lead to change in the way we treat neuroendocrine tumors in the near future is a study called Netropy. But before I go into that, I would like to highlight that we recently opened a neuroendocrine tumor pediatrics program at the University of Kentucky. So um, some of you might know um, that I did a dual residency in internal medicine and pediatrics. So I always like to see pediatric patients. But uh, when I continued to do my oncology training and then gravitated towards neuroendocrine tumor, I always had this inkling that uh, missing my pediatric patients and with the neuro our pediatric neuroendocrine tumor program now we see patients uh, young and old and I'm glad that we have partnered with pediatric oncologists and pediatric surgeons in developing this very unique program now fortunately neuroendocrine tumors are not very common in pediatrics however they do happen in pediatric patients in fact when I was in New Orleans one of my first neuroendocrine publication was a case two-year-old uh, child uh, with neuroendocrine tumors involving kidneys. Having said that, that's my segue to the third very important clinical trial, which might change the way we treat neuroendocrine tumor patients, especially the pediatric neuroendocrine tumor patients. This study is called NETR P. P stands for pediatrics. So neuroendocrine tumor patients 12 to 18 year old, those who have metastatic disease or cannot get surgery, their tumors are inoperable. We really don't have much treatment options in the pediatric patient population. So this study is a very significant advance and hopefully if we can show that this treatment works, is effective and is safe in pediatric population, can certainly lead to changing the way that we treat pediatric neuroendocrine tumor patients. We're very happy to say or announce here that this study would be open at University of Kentucky Markey Cancer Center. Very few select slides have been picked up 
to run Netropy study in Europe and the US and hopefully we will know and, and complete the study in a about year to two year time period and, and I'm eager to see how it turns out. Very briefly, you all know how Lutathera works. Um, as mentioned before, neuroendocrine tumors are very unique in the sense that the tumor surface has somatostatin receptors. We are essentially targeting these somatostatin receptors. So consider somatostatin receptor like a lock and somatostatin analog, in this case, would be dotatate is the key. Now the key likes to go into the lock. So if you attach the key to the keychain, in this case, the keychain being lutetium-177, that's the radionuclide, the lock goes, the key goes into the lock and drags the lutetium-177 along with it, which then goes inside the cell and causes the DNA damage of the tumor. And that's what leads to cell kill. Very, very cool. So study design for netropy is pretty straightforward. Uh, it's a small study, around eight patients are needed. Uh, again, this is very rare condition in pediatric patients, but nevertheless does happen. And patient would be treated with four IV infusions of Lutathera spaced every eight weeks, just kind of like adults. Again, very happy that uh, people are uh, looking into advancing treatment options in our pediatric patients as well. And we are very excited to be able to partner with Novartis on this study. Now, the next segment of my presentation revolves around some very interesting early phase trials. Consider them very, like phase one or early phase two studies. And these are your next generation of studies. So uh, even if they are positive, we might not see change in our practices, but they can have potentially, they can lead to significant uh, changes in the way we think about treating these cancers and then lead to the next generation of phase three studies testing some of these combination compounds. Why do we need to, um, you know, study or, or, or design these phase one studies when we have now access to uh, various different treatment options like Affinitor, Sutent, CAPTEM, PRRT. The short answer is reg regardless of the success we have seen in the last five to seven years in neuroendocrine cancers, there is still a big need for further improvement. We are nowhere close to breast cancer, colorectal cancers, and other big cancer in terms of our treatment options. We still have very few limited treatment options and we need to continue to do better. That's number one. But more importantly, despite Lutathera being such a great drug and has been a significant advance in the way we treat neuronic tumors, very superior drug in terms of median PFS as compared to our older uh, standard of care or controls, there is still need to do better. We can potentially hope for better response rates. That means the ability of drug to shrink the tumors. Um, Lutathera in Netter 1 study showed about 17-18% response rate, which is a significant step up from 5-7-8% of somatostatin analogs or Affinitor. However, can we move this to 30%, 40%, 50%? -50%? There are patients who don't respond to PRRT. We call them PRRT refractory diseases. Can we change that? And lastly, every treatment has some side effects. Can we keep the benefit intact and reduce the side effects, mitigate long-term toxicities? So there's always room to improve on the current practices. How we do or go about that improvement, there are various approaches. In today's presentation, I'd be focusing more on radiopharmaceutical-based next generation of studies. However, there are other chemotherapeutic agents which are being developed, targeted therapies that are currently in development, and immuno-oncology approaches. It is just impossible 
to discuss all oncology pipeline drug development in neuroendocrine tumor in one presentation. So I'm just going to focus on PRRT for this talk and leave the other interesting oncolytic virus, immunotherapy, and small molecule drug development for future. So as I mentioned before, why do we need to improve on the current standard of care? To reduce the toxicity, to increase the effectiveness, and maybe one day aim for cure. So the way investigators in our field are currently thinking about, at least in PRT drug development, is combining PRT, the current PRT agent, with novel anti-tumor agents. And the goal is by combining, you cause more cell kill and hopefully not add too much side effects. In fact, in some cases, we are hoping that we can reduce the dose of radiation, so reduce the side effect while keeping the effectiveness at the same level. There are other approaches where novel or new type of PRT agents are being developed, which emits a different type of radiation, which might be more suitable for maybe larger metastatic burden. Uh, so there are different ways that we are going about it. Let's talk some of those very interesting, very early phase or first in human combination studies. One of these studies just launched um, by a good friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Kenneke and Dr. Mitra. They are studying lutathera in combination with the drug carbozantinib. Now, we also studied that carbozantinib is very active in neuroendocrine tumor, as Dr. Jennifer Chen found out in her phase two study. And currently, we are studying carbozantinib in a phase three study. So, Dr. Kenneke is thinking ahead the next generation of study can we add, safely add carbozantinib to PRRT? PRRT has been established as a standard of care and works. By adding carbozantinib, we believe that it can improve the effectiveness of lutathera even more. So this early phase or phase one study is going to look into safety of this combination and also uh, early signals of effectiveness, whether this, there is some benefit early benefit seen with the, combining these two agents. So I wish them all the very best. And I think this is a very, very interesting study. Next up, another study which I'm very keenly following and, and is very exciting is a study at NIH, which uh, my good friend, Dr. Del Rivero at NIH uh, is leading from Medong side along with Dr. Franklin, who is the PI of this study. He's a nuclear medicine phys, uh, specialist. So in this particular study, he has a two portions. One is the dose escalation phase one part where um, patients are going to be treated with standard dose lutathera and would be adding another anti-cancer agent called PARP inhibitor or laparib. You might have heard about this uh, drug Olaparib, which is a pill because it's FDA approved in certain cancers like ovarian cancers. It has not yet been studied in neuroendocrine tumors and the, the group at NIH, they believe by adding PARP inhibitor like Olaparib, uh, we can perhaps improve the effectiveness of lutathera. The second phase of the study would look into the effectiveness signals, the first phase would look into what was the safe dose of olaparib that can be combined with lutathera. Um, the goal here is, or the rationale uh, of this combination is, lutathera um, has anti-tumor effects because it damages the DNA of the neuronic tumor cells. However, as we know, even after a uh, prolonged period of benefit, the tumor starts growing again. That could be a year from now, two years, three years, sometimes five years, but eventually the cancer cell starts growing back up. And why is that? It's because cancer cells have capacity to regenerate this DNA. So PARP inhibitor like Olaparib affects that capacity or retards the process or slows down the process of the DNA repair. And that's the rationale 
as Dr. Del Rivero and Dr. Len are trying to leverage. All right. Now, let me take this opportunity to discuss some novel early phase trials that we are doing at Markey Cancer Center with the similar goals to help take the next leap in our therapeutic advancement for neuronic tumor patients. Uh, and some of these are phase one, first in human combination studies, and some of them are phase two studies. Let me walk through some of those exciting studies that we are currently conducting here. Our first study I'd like to discuss is using a drug called triapine. Now this drug has some history behind it. This drug is not a very new drug. It's actually been uh, in development for 10, 15 years. It was first developed at Yale. And since then has been tested in various cancer clinical trials as an IV drug, as an oral pill, as a combination with the uh, chemotherapy. But where this drug actually caught attention was when it was added to radiation. This drug is an excellent radiation sensitizer. So how does this work? This drug um, basically depletes the building blocks of DNA in the tumor cells. Now, as I mentioned before, one of the ways which radiation works is cause DNA damage, right? But then tumor cells are smart and they try to regenerate the DNA. And one of the ways they do it is by building more DNA. So if you can slow that process down, you can take away the building blocks of the DNA. So they take longer to come back. This is one of the ways to help improve the, uh, the radiation effect against the cancer cell. So we call these agents radio sensitizers. So this is the way triapine helps achieve anti-tumor effect when added to a DNA damaging agent, in this case, radiation. How do we know about this? So there have been some phase two and larger phase three studies. The phase three study is currently ongoing. So this one particular study I'd like to bring to your notice is uh, led by Dr. Charles Kunos, and they studied triapine as a radiation sensitizer in gynon cancers much more aggressive cancers than neuroendocrine tumors. And what they saw that when triapine was added to the external beam radiation, then there were significant uh, responses, about 96% complete responses. So which is very, very interesting. This caught our interest and we wanted to study what happens if we add triapine to radiation in neuroendocrine tumor cells. This is some of our preclinical or lab data in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor cells done in our lab. And as you can see here, when the triapine is added to the radiation and we radiate these neuroendocrine tumor cells, there is significant reduction in the number of cells. So that means that this, these cells die much more easily as compared to if there was a no triapine on board. Based on our data, we approached NCI to help us conduct this human study, we believe triapine when added to PRRT would significantly benefit patients and cause the tumors to remain stable or even for that matter shrink more as compared to if they, we don't add triapine to PRRT. So the study design is pretty straightforward. We are adding on the current standard of care, which is lutathera. The patient will get the standard of care dose of Lutathera, IV infusion every four, every eight weeks times four doses. But the novel aspect of this study is that patient will also get access to triapine, which is an oral pill during the, for the 14 days during the PRRT infusions. This being a phase one study, we are trying to find what would be the safe dose of triapine that can be added to Lutathera without causing side effects at the same time that our patients can benefit. As I mentioned before, we are studying various doses of triapine. We don't wanna reduce the dose of lutathera for this study because that has been already tested and studied. So we don't wanna give less than effective or proven treatment 
uh, to our patients but at the same time we want to add a punch to this combination and make sure that the patient can potentially benefit from this novel combination so we are we are testing various doses and the way phase one study works is few patients are treated at a dose and if they do well then we treat the next few patients a little bit higher dose and we keep going higher till our predefined maximum dose and then we take a call which dose would be suitable to move the drug forward for phase two and phase three besides just uh, looking for safety and effectiveness signals we are also studying a lot of interesting and cool science in these uh, phase one uh, studies as you know, neuroendocrine tumors is relatively rare as compared to colon cancer or breast cancer, prostate cancer. So there is still a lot of knowledge gap in, 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 in our understanding of the genetics of these cancers and why these cancers develop, and why do certain patients respond so well to PRT and others don't, etc. So we use these unique opportunities to study the cancer so that the next generation uh, of studies can be built even more smarter and in that uh, respect we are studying the tumor DNA both circulating DNA the tumor tissue uh, we are biopsying the patients and uh, looking for RNA sequencing and whole exome sequencing and we are also looking for drug levels uh, what we call pharmacokinetics how does lutathera affect the triping blood levels and how does different doses affect triping blood levels and what are considered safe and what are not so a lot of very interesting science is built into this which will hopefully help us understand um, and make sense of these results and when we move this concept forward if we move it forward how to make it even better and suitable for our patients so this is um, again this is a trial which is ongoing so i can't disclose the results um, however, I'll just share one snippet. This is my first patient which was uh, put on this study, has now finished the, the treatment, all four doses. And what you can see here is uh, this is the first scan after the completion of treatment and we are already seeing 35% reduction in the tumor volume. Okay, This is quite significant. Call it a beginner's luck. This is my first clinical trial as the national PI on this study. And this study is open at various centers, including Mayo Clinic, Northwestern, City of Hope, Moffitt Cancer Center. Um, so I'm very, very pleased that the patients are benefiting and it's kind of very gratifying that all these years of effort is at least bearing some fruit. But again, this is way too early. This is just one patient of the whole trial. We are eagerly waiting how the when the trial finishes, how uh, what kind of safety signals we see in the full cohort and the effectiveness signals we see in the full cohort. So hopefully we'll have the results for you in about a year, year and a half. Now moving on to another very interesting study that we are conducting here at University of Kentucky Markey Cancer Center. Um, and this study is using a drug called M3814. In fact, when I first started working with this particular age and it did not even have a name. So that, that's what we called it, M3814. This is 2018. Now the drug has a name, it's called Peposertip, which is always good. I, I like the names better than the numbers, easy to remember. So we are studying Peposertip, which is a drug um, manufactured by German Merck, KGA and is it developed in with help of NCI, National Cancer Institute, CTAP. The concept is very similar. So as I mentioned before, one of the ways that the tumor cells, despite having DNA damage, either with the radiation or chemotherapy, it survives that damage is by repairing its DNA. One of the enzymes that helps that DNA repair is called DNAPK or DNA protein kinase. So some very smart scientists figured out if we can target that enzyme, we can slow down this DNA repair process. And they found that by inhibiting that DNA PK, they were able to slow down the growth of various cancers. 
And that's basic crux of uh, adding a DNA PK inhibitor to a DNA damaging agent. So this is 2018. I am freshly minted uh, from my fellowship and I start my new faculty position at University of Kentucky. Very grateful to my mentors and NCI for funding this study where I got the drug from the Merck, the German Merck, and funding from NCI to study the effectiveness of M3814 or peposertib in neuroendocrine tumor cells in our lab. We worked hard for next nine months in labs, growing these tumors in the mice. These are pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors and in the petri tissues and testing various doses of radiation, various doses of peposertib. And uh, this is what we saw. When we added this drug, M3814, now called as peposertib, to the radiation, there was significant growth reduction in the tumors as compared to radiation, as compared to the drug by itself. As you can see here, the drug by itself, M3814, doesn't do anything. There's no tumor uh, reduction. And, and that makes sense, right? Because you have to cause the DNA damage for the DNA repair drug inhibitor to work, right? So you have to first induce the DNA damage either by chemo or radiation and then give the drug. So when you combine it to a DNA damaging agent, it does cause significant tumor growth reduction. And that's what we saw here. I presented this data in Nanets in Boston in 2019. There was, uh, you know, a lot of enthusiasm with uh, with this particular very new agent, and uh, we approached NCI to help us study this in human patients, and and uh, and fortunately they have approved this concept. In fact, we've been working hard with NCI for the past six months in developing this protocol and getting it through FDA and CTAP and CIRB. I'm happy to notify that this protocol would be up and running any day now. In fact, I expect it to open for patient enrollment in about two weeks or less. Study design, again, is very simple. When, at least it's my philosophy. When we design studies, we want to make sure it's as patient-friendly as possible. Because even if these studies are in one day in future are positive and make it to standard of care, then it, it should make sense for the doctors in the community and the patients who are going to be using these treatments, that it's easy for them because at the end of the quality of life matters. So the studies are very simple. It adds on to the lutathera, the four doses of lutathera. And we then administer oral peposertib for the 21 days uh, during that each lutathera cycle. That's when most of the DNA damage is happening, the first 21 days after the lutathera. So that's when we target those tumor cells by the oral peposertib. Again, just like our triapine study, we are using this very unique opportunity to advance our knowledge about neuroendocrine tumors and learning the science and advancing the science. So we are uh, going to study the tumor genetics, circulating tumor DNA, RNA sequencing, the plasma levels of peposertib, how that gets affected by lutathera at various doses, etc. And very recently, we found a completely new biomarker never been studied in neuroendocrine tumors before. And this is a very easy and rapid to check biomarker called HBGAT. We also call it progastrin. I recently presented these findings at ENETS earlier this year. And as you can see here, neuroendocrine tumor patients, regardless where the patient tumor originates, GI tract, lung, regardless of the grade of neuroendocrine tumors, low grade or high grade, this was found elevated as compared to normal healthy people. So we are going to study this blood-based biomarker and see if we can use this to monitor the disease. Um, many times in neuroendocrine cancer patients, we do scans three months, four months, six months apart. We can't do too many scans, but this is a very easy to do, very rapid, hopefully very cheap blood test where we can do a spot check and see how the tumor is doing. And at least that's our intention, to find a reliable, easy to do monitoring tool. So we have built this biomark in our clinical trial and see if it correlates with the scan changes. 
Lastly, I would like to uh, highlight another study that we developed at Markey Cancer Center. It is a little larger study. It's a phase two study, unlike the first two studies, which are phase one, first in human combination studies. Now, this combination has already been done in current practice. So you've heard about the drug called teletrostat ethyl or Zermelo. This drug has been approved for carcinoid syndrome diarrhea, which is refractory to somatostatin analog. And the drug works in a very unique way. It inhibits this enzyme called tryptophan hydroxylase. This is a very important enzyme which converts the amino acid tryptophan into final end products, serotonin. And you all know serotonin. Serotonin is secreted by some neuroendocrine tumor cells and can cause you flushing, wheezing, diarrhea, and a multitude of other carcinoid syndrome symptoms. However, many of you all probably don't know that serotonin has also been linked to neuroendocrine tumor cell growth. So not just uh, high, high serotonin is bad for carcinoid syndrome, but it, can, it is believed that it can also potentially increase the proliferation growth of neuroendocrine tumor cells. So it's always advised to lower the serotonin for both symptom control as well as overall outcome is better if the serotonins are under control in, in those patients where the serotonin is elevated. Now that's our rationale with combining PRRT with Zermelo. So PRRT by itself has been proven that it is very effective and can keep disease stable for a very long time. Now by P adding Zermelo to PRRT, can we keep the disease stable for even longer, maybe twice the amount of time? And, and, and with those kind of high goals that we designed this study, we are going to be testing two different doses of Zermelo. One is 250 milligram POTID standard dose of Zermelo and the other one would be 500 milligram POTID, and we'll combine it to the standard lutetherate dose, which are four IV infusions every two months. This, unfortunately, is a single center study. It's only open at Markey Cancer Center, unlike our other two studies, which are multi-center and hopefully would be open at various sites. Um, we are looking to enroll about 70 patients. Now, Zermelo is a very safe drug. Has been, it's, uh, you know, the, the side effect of Zermelo is the big one is constipation. So it's a very safe drug. And we recently, um, in last year, Nanats uh, presented safety data of combination of Zermelo with PRRT. So we're not worried about the safety, uh, you know, based on our previous experience. We don't believe that there will be any additive side effect profile. And there is a potential to see improvement in outcomes. So we are very excited about this new study and this should be open for enrollment in uh, within the next four weeks. With that, uh, I'd like to conclude most of our, uh, you know, low grade directed or well differentiated neuronic tumor directed clinical trials. Today we discussed trials which will change, which can potentially change the way we treat cancer, neuronic tumor in the near future. Carbozantinib study, the cabinet study, the COMPETE study, the uh, lutetium edotriotide versus Affinitor, and the Netropy study. And then we discussed some really cutting edge novel phase one, first in human combination studies, which my friends from NIH and some in Oregon and we here at Markey are currently working on. Lastly, I would like to mention there is a subgroup of neuroendocrine cancer patients called high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas. These are much aggressive cancers, also much rarer, and are in dire need for newer treatment options. Uh, and we are not um, going to focus on these high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma clinical trials, but uh, just wanted to uh, highlight that there is drug development happening for high-grade neuroendocrine cancers as well and these are some of the trials we have opened at Markey Cancer Center for high grades and this is an area of critical unmet need. With that I would like to thank thank you so much LACNETS for having me here. Uh, this is probably I think my first West Coast presentation uh, at a patient uh, symposium and uh, I really appreciate uh, this invite and I love to talk uh, more 
uh, with you all in the Q&A section and address any of your questions, concerns. Uh, and thank you again for having me here. Thank you, Dr. Chohan, for joining us again today. Wow, what a fascinating, informative, and very encouraging presentation. I've heard many patients say to me, if like XYZ doesn't work, what options do I have left? Meaning it's really easy to feel hopeless, right? About the possible tr treatment options. So it's really uplifting to hear you share today about all the work being done I mean, from phase three all the way down to the early clinical trials and all the possibilities that's out there for net treatment. So thank you for that. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Um, I completely agree with your sentiments. In fact, that's one of my biggest motivating factor why I do oncology or wanted to do oncology because there's so much more that we have yet to achieve. And uh, by clinical drug development and clinical trials is where how we can hopefully one day uh, see better outcomes in all cancer types, especially neuroendocrine tumors. Yeah. And it's clear that, you know, you're excited about achieving that, not just in, you know, all the work you're doing, but even when you're talking about all the work, you get really excited. So thank you for sharing that with us. So let's get to the Q&A. There's uh, so many questions that have come in and thanks for being willing to answer all these questions. So there's a, um, a lot of, you know, talk that you shared about all these various combinations, PRT and other agents, so many other agents. So with all these different agents in mind and Luthathera alone that's available, how do you determine which one's best for a particular patient? Right. Um, so these are good problems to have. A few years back, we did not have enough trial options, right? So we are now in an area that we not only have standard of care PRRT Ludothera, but we have Ludothera combination studies or access to them. So this brings us to a very unique problems of sort that how to pick and choose what studies best for others. Now, some of these issues are sorted on its own because uh, the nature of phase one studies are, uh, we enroll very few patients at any point of time. So at any single time, there might be only one, two or three spots open in any particular study. And these studies being multi-center in nature, there's a lot of competition. So it's first come, first serve. Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, recently, about two weeks back, we opened uh, one of the cohorts for triapine studies. There were only three spots and we took two spots at Markey and Northwestern took the third spot. So my friend at Ohio State was, she, they just missed out by a few hours. So there's a lot of uh, competition spots um, and so so uh, many a times there's just not uh, enough spots left and and uh, and once uh, so that's one of the issues with this phase one study because we are we don't want to treat a lot of patients we are still in a very early phase of learning so um, so that's one of the issues however if let's suppose I do have patients um, and the spots are there for various studies I do discuss pros and cons of each of those with the patients. With PRRT or standard of care, we have the best data in terms of safety profile and how well the drugs work, right? So it's very easy to tell the patient, why did the FDA approve it? How did, how is this drug better than any other drug? And then when we talk about the clinical trial, I'll explain to my patient the rationale behind the trial. Why are we adding something to the Lutathera, what is our intention of doing that? And what could be potential issues? The potential issues could be the side, side effect profile is unknown. And that's why these are called phase one, early phase trial. We are really learning more about the safety of the combination at the same time shooting for improved efficacy. So, uh, you know, it's at the end of day, it's patient who makes the decision. I empower the patient to have these choices and discuss risk and potential benefits and leave it up to the patient to see what fits for them. Sometimes the trial is not a good option for patient because of just pure logistics reason. Somebody's coming from a far off place or a state for me and they don't have access to the trial in that particular region. Uh, other times there could be a medical other comorbidities which are excluded from a clinical trial. 
So really my job is not to filter out, I give them all the options. The fact that we have studied these drugs in preclinical models and have now uh, translated them to clinical trials, um, we do believe in these trials, right? So, so uh, you know, but I try to limit my personal bias and kind of pre present a, 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 a clear picture and let the patient decide. Now, certain patients, I would, however, be a little cautious, uh, especially if, let's suppose, I have a young neuronicin tumor patient. And one of the issues with PRRT is long-term uh, safety, right? So uh, these are the patients I might uh, suggest that we proceed with standard treatment uh, rather than early phase clinical trial for very young patients just because of the unknowns, uh, the long-term side effect profile. High-risk patients, high bulk disease, very symptomatic patients, patients with extrahepatic disease, patients with a lot of mesenteric disease, we know the PRT does work there, but not as effective in mesentery as, for example, in bone mats or liver mats. So high-risk patients, challenging patients, can potentially benefit more from radiosensitization because one of the goals in these combination studies is to increase the effectiveness of PRT, increase the cytoreductivity or shrinkage of these tumors. So, so those might be a better candidates for some of these combination studies. Uh, however, it is a little challenging and we leave it up to the patient to discuss. Our mandate from NCI is clinical trial participations because that's how we move the science forward, especially for neuroendocrine cancers. Um, we still are far away from a time point where unlike breast cancer or colon cancer, we have multiple, multiple types of treatments available. We have only very few treatment options. So clinical trial participation is encouraged if the trials are thoughtfully designed and there is a mechanism to monitor the patients. And in case if there are toxicities, there is a plan how to mitigate those toxicities or, or, or manage those. Yeah, that was, thank you for that really thorough answer. I hear you saying that it's a complicated decision and it really requires a really um, in-depth conversation with your providers and with the investigator to make this kind of decision. Mm -hmm. And I also hear you saying that you're networking with other uh, people who are doing trials so you can see who has spots and work that in. So it's not just about you having spots, but other people having that too. Okay. Um, you know, along those lines about uh, avoiding radiation, you mentioned with, you know, a young person. So one person actually said that I want to avoid radiation of PRT. So instead of DOTA and um, Ludothera 177, is there a trial using DOTA and chemo? Right. So um, avoiding radiation of PRT um, you know, some patients are concerned about radiation effects. However, the data to date is very reassuring. So I do want to reassure the audience here that both short-term and long-term safety data regarding the radionuclide-based treatment, at least for NETS, is very, very promising. Um, one of the things that we will worry about um, long-term side effects is myelotoxicities or effect on bone marrow uh, called myelodysplastic syndrome or acute leukemia. So blood cancers as a secondary uh, issues stemming from prior radiation exposure. And it's really good to know uh, that the published literature in most of the studies reported to be about 2% or less than 2%. And this is long-term risk factor. Um, having said that, the chemotherapies, certain chemotherapies also suffer from these long-term bone marrow leukemogenic or MDS effects. For example, uh, timozolomide, one of the chemo drugs we use in Cape 10, is known to cause uh, myelotoxicity and can increase the risk for uh, long-term bone marrow side effects. 
So as of now, the data for PRRT or any radiation or radionuclide based treatment is very reassuring. In the US, we don't we haven't been using it for a long time, but there is a considerable amount of data on use of PRRT from Europe. And if you look into those experiences from some of the centers of excellence, these and these are in public domain published uh, very recently, Dr. Strasberg pooled all the studies and kind of reviewed some of the data for the PRRT. And he also reported very reassuring uh, signals in terms of long-term safety with the PRRT. So I, I don't think that there is a major concern um, for the time being. However, every patient is unique and we have to do risk stratification for individual patients. There could have been something in the history of patient that we might consider them high risk. For example, prolonged exposure to certain chemotherapies in past, prolonged exposure to certain other radiation-based therapies in past, or prior history of some sort of bone marrow disease that might make them high risk for radiation-based treatments. So if somebody has those issues, they need to have a detailed discussion with their oncologist and, and see which one would be a better treatment option for them. And if that's the case, I would not advocate for doing a chemo plus PRRT. Then there might be other trials, some of those we mentioned today. For example, carbozantinib study is a very good study with to my knowledge, I don't think there is any risk for long-term leukemias or bone marrow issues. So we always have to individualize a treatment for the, each patient. I would not advocate for chemo plus dotatate uh, at the time uh, because there have been now two studies which have been done with the chemotherapy and PRRT combinations. And both of these studies have been less than uh, impressive and in fact there have been some concern for added toxicity when you added chemotherapy and the chemotherapy to be uh, precise is Cape Tam, which was studied with PRRT so I would not advise chemo plus PRRT unless it is done under clinical trial protocol not as a routine practice for now. Hmm. Thank you for that excellent summary. I know that um, I was looking into this data too of chemo plus PRT with my husband's treatment. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is really interesting. Uh, just a plug, uh, just a FYI for those who are concerned about radiation of PRT next month with our annual conference, Dr. Tom Hope is giving a presentation on radiation safety with PRT. So that's a good talk to listen to. Um, and you know, we've talked, <laughs> we've talked a lot about side effects. You've already been touching on this a little bit. So with the PRT combination trials, I know it might be early because they're early trials, but how do you anticipate side effects to compare to Lutathera alone? Because as you see, you know, people are worried about just undergoing Lutathera and then adding something on top of it might feel a little scary. Right. Great question. It's a million dollar question. We are trying to answer this question right now. Uh, certain combinations are safe. For example, one of the studies that I mentioned, the phase two study with dilitrostat ethyl and lutathera, we presented some safety data with the combination at last nanos. Uh, we pooled all the uh, data from prior Telestar and uh, Telecast patients who end up getting both PRT and Zermelo and looked into the safety and we did not really find any added safety signals. And that makes sense because Zermelo, the way it works, it doesn't, it has non-overlapping side effect profile as compared to PRRT. So certain combinations are very easy to say that this is probably going to be fine. Kind of like saying adding somatostatin analog to PRRT. We don't worry about those combinations. But when we talk about adding chemotherapies, targeted therapies, um, as radiation sensitizers to some of the PRRT agents, the toxicity is uh, definitely one of the concern. And that's why we do these phase one studies. These phase one studies are not easy to do. 
They're very complex and we have to pay a lot of attention to individual patients. These studies are often done in dedicated phase one units. So not all cancer centers who do clinical trials often do first in human phase one studies. So these are centers with very skilled uh, phase one unit and the nursing research coordinators are in tune with the demands of these integrate studies. We have to be ready to act fast as soon as somebody has issues or side effects. Uh, so it is of concern and that's why we do these phase one studies. But there are ways that we try to circumvent these issues. So, so we usually know what would be the effective dose and as a single agent. When we do combination studies, one of the things we do is we slowly do dose escalation. So we don't start off with the full dose. So we try to raise the dose slowly as the patient, uh, uh, you know, uh, as the patients or the cohorts uh, experience no or minimal toxicity, that's when we, we go to the higher dose. So, so we, we, we always patient safety is first. And, and certain combinations are rejected outright by either our scientific committees or FDA or IRBs based on toxicity profiles. So there's, there has to be preclinical, so really good preclinical data for both effectiveness and safety, right? So we, we generate those data and it has to make rational. And the way we design these protocols, we don't test the, the most, the highest dose to begin with. So we slowly dose escalate. Uh, and these are the ways that, you know, we do or design these phase one studies. And that's why it also takes much longer to, to finish these studies. It's not the number of patients. These phase one studies only require 15 to 20 patients, but we go very slowly. We watch them very closely. So those are some of the ways to kind of circumvent some of these issues. But of course, we can't completely guarantee. And that's the whole reason why we do the phase one studies. The idea, eventual goal is that we will find a potential safe dose, which is safe to be taken with Lutathera, and that's the dose which will move to a subsequent uh, phase two and phase three. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's our eventual goal. And most often we are able to find that right dose. So we move up very slowly uh, and uh, uh, and yeah, so these phase one studies are designed to answer the safety question first. Now, when we have found a good combination, we take the drug forward to a randomized phase two or a phase three. That's when we know whether the combination is better than the drug alone. Okay. We can get some hints early on based on the sample size and how effective is the drug in controlling the tumor and shrinking the tumor. But the real way to know for sure is a randomized controlled trial where you pit it against the current standard and then compare. And that's where you also, of course, compare the side effect profile of the single agent versus a combination and you get more data. Wow, thank you for that really, again, very clear and thorough explanation. And that really gives us an idea of how you really handle phase one with kid gloves, right? So that it's not just all the sun, but with a lot of attention and intention. So, um, that's yeah, getting a lot of care lately in the last two years, <laughs> <laughs> lot of, a lot of, uh, lot of, uh, phone calls, a lot of communication with the research staff. It really takes a village to do a phase one study. I mean, it is not easy, but it is fun. It is not easy. Well, thank you for all that hard work and um, someone's got to do it and we're glad it's you. <laughs> um, so another question came up about PRT. Can it can we use it as adjuvant uh, therapy and assess outcome? Right. Great question. So just to kind of put a little background to that question, I guess. Uh, prior to approval of PRT or Ludothera, let's because that's the approved agent. Prior to Ludothera, there were very few agents uh, in this space, right? And their effectiveness in terms of shrinking the tumor is very limited. For example, 
somatostatin analogs like sandostatin or landriotide, the response rates are 5% or less. That means uh, the, the, you know, the chances of shrinking the tumor. They're really good in keeping the tumor uh, stable. They're called cytostatic agent. But you know, if we have to shrink the tumor, there are certain scenarios that we need the tumor sh to shrink. They're really limited. Then the next drug which came, Afinitor or Avrolimus, it was a little bit better in terms of tumor shrinkage, but not a whole lot better. Uh, I would say about seven to eight percent response rates. So we are still in single digit. So when PRRT or Lutathera was evaluated in this randomized phase three Netro one study, we saw response rates about 17, 18 percent. So this is a big, big jump from five and seven percent. So we are finally in double digits and, and, and it's pretty impressive. Um, so there are situations where we want to shrink the tumors. These are the patients, for example, big bulky disease, functional syndrome. The bigger the tumor, the more hormone they're producing and pushing out into the blood and making patients feel sicker. So we try to cytoreduce or shrink the tumor. The other situation where we do need good drugs to shrink the tumor is if the patient is presented with early stage disease, but the surgery is not possible because of some questionable involvement of nearby blood vessel or veins or the nerves and and uh, and and surgeon would like or appreciate if we can shrink the tumor a bit to make the surgery uh, you know more feasible better easier to do and in those kind of situation we try to give certain treatments as new adjuvant so that's what new adjuvant means um, you know to give it before to shrink the tumors but if the tumor is clearly resectable, then we, we don't want to give the PRRT as neoadjuvant unless it is done in the clinical trial protocol. Now, the question is about adjuvant therapy, right? Adjuvant is done after the surgery. So we found a tumor, for example, in the pancreas and the patient underwent a Whipple surgery, uh, pancreas was taken out, the tumor is gone. There's no more tumor left. If the patient has no visible or measurable disease, then there's no point giving PRT. The way the PRT works is that it needs somatostatin receptor positive tumor for the drug to attach itself to and then work. If there is nothing left after the surgery, then there's really, we are just exposing the patient to radiation without any overt benefit. So as an adjuvant therapy, after the surgery, if there is no disease left, there is really no role of doing PRT unless somebody is doing it under a clinical trial protocol. Um, and and it's, it's, it's going to be difficult to justify that rationale, even in the trial. Now, if there is some residual disease left after the surgery, then it can be considered on case by case basis. However, PRRT right now is not approved typically in that setting. Uh, it's approved as a second or third line agent after SSAs in a metastatic unresceptable disease gap nets, right? So I can see where we can use PRRT as neoadjuvant if the case is not resectable and surgeons think that if, if the tumor has significant shrinkage, then we can convert this into a more resectable disease. And anytime in nets, if it's an early stage disease, surgery is always preferred. If you can get the tumor out and make the patient no evidence of disease, NED, that's always ideal. We only do systemic therapies like somatostatin analogs, Afinitor, PRRT, or for that matter, any other drug in unresectable diseases, metastatic diseases, where we cannot get rid of the entire disease and we just try to then control the disease and slow the tumor down. So, uh, yeah, those are my two cents. <laughs> you gave us more than two cents there. That's very helpful because I know this question comes up a lot as well. Um, Thank you. And you kind of already kind of touched on about no receptors, but, you know, someone also did ask what studies do you have for high grade net and next where there are no somatostatin receptors and, and not just high grade, right? I mean, there's other types, um, low and intermediate that might not have receptors. So what, what, 
studies you have for that? Right. Um, so great question. Unfortunately, as the grade of the cancer in the neuroendocrine tumor space increases, the receptor, the prevalence of somatostatin receptor dips down. Uh, high-grade neuroendocrine cancers have less and less somatostatin receptors. Some might have faint amount of, uh, you know, if we do net spots, some faint uptake, some might have no uptake. So it's not an uncommon scenario. In fact, the published literature on high grades and somatostatin receptors hovers around 20-30% range um, that only 20-30% patients with high-grade neuroendocrine cancers tend to have a positive gallium scan or octreo scan, or that means uh, positive for somatostatin receptors. Unlike low-grade nets where majority, 80-90% patients would have a positive scan, that means they have a lot of somatostatin receptors. We need these receptors because these are our targets for PRRT. So in high-grade neuroendocrine cancers with no receptors, PRRT is usually is not recommended. But we are looking at other areas how to attack these cancers. And uh, we do have a couple of uh, studies open. I did mention uh, in a very quick snapshot in my last slide in the clinic, uh, in this talk, uh, where I listed some of the trials that we have open at Markey Cancer Center catering to high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma patients. Some of these trials are using immunotherapy routes, so ipi, ipilumumab and nivolumab combination in addition to carbozantinib, so it's a triplet study that we have it open here. Um, and there is another study using chemotherapy combination topotecan with a new drug called ATR inhibitor. It works in a very similar way uh, like some of the drugs I've talked about. Uh, it uh, Topotecan is an old chemotherapy drug that we use in neuroendocrine cancer management and it works by damaging the tumor DNA. And ATR inhibitor prevents the DNA repair in the tumor cells. So by adding these drugs together, uh, the, the goal is that we can keep the tumors in remission longer. Now, these are um, you know phase two studies. There has been some promising data with this combination in phase one study um, published by Dr. Anish Thomas at NIH. And this is open in public domain, and you can see some of these data. So we have that study open here as well. And this study is open for small cell uh, sub-cohort of high-grade neuroendocrine cancer, small cell of any site in the body. Besides that, we have some phase one studies which are applicable to all cancer types, not just high-grade neuroendocrine cancer. So those some of those phase one studies uh, can be very useful for uh, high-grade neuroendocrine cancer patients, but we have to be cautious. See, it's not one size fits all, so we have to look into the drug and the rationale and does it make sense for high-grade neuroendocrine cancer patients. So that's uh, another thing that we are looking into. Uh, certain studies are in pipeline with oncolytic viruses, etc. So we have few studies which uh, high-grade neuroendocrine cancer patients can benefit from. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, sounds like you have a lot going on and we could have a whole nother webinar just on high grade. Um, and you touched on this in, in your answer just there, but um, just to clarify again, are there any studies using carboxantinib for high grade? Yes, I'm actually very excited about uh, <clears throat> the carboxantinib study in high grades. We have a study open where <clears throat> carboxantinib is combined with IP and NEVO. It's a multi-center study, um, and um, the rationale is the, the carbozantinib is, we have some really good data with carbozantinib in low-grade nets in the phase two setting with from Dr. Chan's study. And uh, <clears throat> if we combine it with immunotherapy, there tend to be, uh, there is a rationale that it will make the immunotherapy work even better. How do we know that? Uh, we know that from bladder cancers and some uh, urological cancers, when carbozantinib was added to immunotherapy, the response rates and the effectiveness of immunotherapy drug increased drastically. 
So that's the rationale uh, has been leveraged with this combination study. It's an NCI, so it's a federally funded study, multi-center study. Uh, Dr. Tesfai from Wayne State University in Detroit is the, is the national lead investigator for this study. And I'm very optimistic uh, about this particular study of high grades because there's already a little bit of data from SWOG 1609 study suggesting that ipilimumab nivolumab combination might be active in high grades. Now you're adding another agent, carbozantinib, which seems to be synergistic with immunotherapy. So I'm very excited about this study. It is ongoing. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that we, we do have a carbozantinib study for high grades. Great. And that sounds exciting and your excitement is contagious. <laughs> um, you also mentioned the oncolytic virus. So uh, this would be a great time because this question came up about that too. What is the status of the oncolytic virus clinical great trial? Time. Yes, yes, yes. You, that must be on purpose or you had a question ready? <laughs> we had a All question right. already. Good. So um, oncolytic, see, uh, immunotherapy is a very exciting field in cancer. And uh, this is a relatively new field. Um, you know, we did not have a lot of uh, immunotherapy agent when I was getting trained. And then as soon as I finish it, finished my fellowship, a lot of new immunotherapy drugs came to market, got FDA approval. It all started with kidney cancer, melanoma, skin cancers. And now there's hardly any cancer types where immunotherapy is not being evaluated. And by immunotherapy, what we mean is immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, so, but immunotherapy does not just limit to immune checkpoint inhibitor like nivolumab, pembrolizumab, kitruda, ipilimumab, etc. Immunotherapy is basically using or harnessing our immune system to fight against cancer cell, right? So any drug or class of drugs which can do that in principle is an immunotherapy drug. So that could be a vaccine, a cancer vaccine. That could be an oncolytic virus. So what is an oncolytic virus? It is a virus which is engineered to infect cancer cells and not um, infect host cells or, or cause issues to the host. We are just bioengineered uh, some of these viruses to specifically target cancer cells. And when it infects the cancer cells, it goes and divides in the cancer cells, elicit an immune response and inflammatory response. And then when there's an inflammation, what happens our body fights that inflammation, it sends in the white blood cells, try to kill this uh, foreign agent and try to wipe it off. So that's how, that's the basic premise of oncolytic virus therapy. Many a cancers, why are they able to, um, you know, incubate in the body and, and grow without any issues is because they tend not to generate an immune response. Uh, our immune system uh, is not able to see them, see these tumors growing. So by administering oncolytic virus, sometimes we are making our immune system aware of these cancers in the body uh, by way, means of, uh, as I mentioned, uh, an inflammatory response. Sometimes these oncolytic viruses are designed just to attack the DNA of the tumor cells and just kill the, the, the tumor cells by means of pure viral infection and replication. So there are various ways that the oncolytic virus works against cancer cells. Now, oncolytic virus therapy uh, sounds novel, but it's been in development for some time. In fact, we, we have a, a FDA approved oncolytic virus for certain cancers like TVEC virus. However, there are a lot of new oncolytic virus currently being developed in various cancer types. We recently wrote an article describing the current landscape of oncolytic virus in various cancers. There are over 20 or 30 clinical trials looking at different type of oncolytic viruses, either as themselves a single agent or as a combination with other immunotherapy drugs in various cancer styles. That's why I got interested in oncolytic viruses I think there is a there is a potential role for oncolytic virus therapy in management of both low grade and high grade neuroendocrine cancers. So I'm uh, currently uh, developing a, a protocol with uh, pharmaceutical company um, looking into a combination with immunotherapy and oncolytic virus called 
Seneca Valley virus, which likes to attack cancer cells, which are positive for TEM8. This is a protein which is very readily expressed in various cancers, especially neuroendocrine cancers, especially high-grade neuroendocrine cancers. So I'm hoping that we should be able to launch this study maybe third or fourth quarter of this year. Uh, again, of course, uh, uh, there are a lot of moving parts to it, and I'm just an investigator. So, so you know, I can't really promise, you know, there are things beyond I'm like bottom of the totem pole. <laughs> But I'm very, very excited about this novel oncolytic virus study, which might be open. And there is another study which we will be opening very soon at Markey Cancer Center. In fact, I just presented it at our PRMC uh, meeting earlier this week. Uh, that is far uh, advanced because the protocol is already, and I'm hoping to be able to open that study within the next two to two and a half months at Markey Cancer Center. It is a phase one oncolytic virus study where we can enroll both low grade and high grade neuroendocrine cancer patients appropriate for that particular treatment. So it is coming and as soon as it's there, I will make it public, uh, you know, but I'm very excited. Uh, I think there's clear role for immunotherapies. We have all seen success of immunotherapies. Unfortunately, it just doesn't work for everybody. So we are trying to improve on the current immunotherapies uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor doesn't work for everybody, especially in low-grade nets. In high-grade nets, it seems that some people benefit and some don't. Can we make it better? And oncolytic viruses, that's the idea to make cold tumors hot, make less immunogenic tumors, more immunogenic, and it seems to uh, synergize with other form of immunotherapies like immune checkpoint inhibitors. So I'm very, very excited, very promising. That's really exciting. I had no idea that you had all that, in, you know, in the works. And uh, seems like you didn't think you were busy enough, huh? <laughs> uh, well, that's fun. Busy is fun. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and on a somewhat related note, I mean, of course, people are thinking about this in this current time um, with the anti-cancer uh, vaccines based on the MRI technology, the Moderna technology. Can such vaccines also be used to treat net or neck? Uh, that's a wonderful question, great question. And, uh, you know, there's just not one way uh, to develop uh, immunotherapies. For example, now we are talking about cancer vaccines. I know that there uh, was some talks about cancer vaccine trials in Europe, and I'm unfortunately not aware of the current status of that. And I'm not uh, of course, because I'm not privy to that particular trial. So I'm not sure what vaccine technology they use but clearly you know uh, it can be bioengineered again i don't um, this this is not my area of expertise especially the vaccine drug development so i'd like to not mislead our audience clearly i think the technology works for covid and we were able to churn out not one but two drugs uh, you know uh, as vaccines for coronavirus in such a brisk pace. Uh, can this technology be leveraged for cancer therapeutics yet to be seen? Um, I'm not the right person, unfortunately, to comment on it, and I would not like to mislead the, the audience here. Okay, well, thank you for that honest answer. Um, you know, you you gave really good explanations about the mechanism of action, and there's a lot of stuff about the DNA repair. So do these drugs which slow down the DNA repair process also slow down and negatively affect the normal cell repair processes? That's, that's a wonderful question. And um, the short answer is no. Um, and uh, that's the reason why we are trying to find the right drug. So these are not just, you know, DNA broad, broadly acting DNA damaging agents like chemotherapy. See, that's what the chemotherapy does. Uh, you know, it just goes and destroys any actively dividing cell. Now, the chemotherapy drugs kill cancer more than the normal cell because cancer cells are dividing much faster than normal cells. So that's the basic premise. But because there are some other body cells which are also dividing and it affects them, and that's why we see some side effects from the chemotherapy, and that's low blood count, uh, you know, enteritis and diarrhea and all those things. 
Now, some of these drugs that we are studying, like for example, peposuritib is a DNA PK inhibitor. Now, they do not seem, based on our current lab data, seem to affect normal cells. Now, this particular enzyme is only upregulated in those cells where the DNA damage has occurred artificially, okay? So if we ra irradiate a cancer cells, let's suppose by Lutathera, that's which induce the DNA damage in that particular cell. What we see is, at least in our mouse models, that when we look for DNA PK, the protein uh, levels, we see there's a certain surge of that after the DNA damage process. So, when we inhibit the DNA PK, it's only happening in those tumors where the DNA damage occurred. So we are not seeing this high levels of DNA PKs in normal body cells. If we did, yes, then theoretically it would start affecting all cells, but that's not, we don't see that. So uh, we not only have the mouse model data, we also have human data. So the peposertib, the DNA PK inhibitor, has been studied in humans as a single agent, uh, and it's completely safe. Also, there is no effect on tumors. As I mentioned, by itself, the drug doesn't do anything, right? So you really need this drug to be combined with a DNA damaging agent for it to work. So we have a safety data on M1314 or peposertib or DNA PK inhibitor um, on humans so, and then that kind of confirms that it does not really affect normal body cells. It affects those cancer cells where the DNA damage has occurred and we have caused that DNA damage on purpose, either with the help of radiation like PRRT or with the help of chemotherapy, drugs like topotecan, and that's where it goes behind and then try to prevent the DNA repair that happens in those cells and that's how uh, cancer cells develop radiation resistance, right? So we are trying to prevent that by preventing uh, or delaying the repair process. So I believe that it does not affect normal cells and that's the current uh, data from phase one studies in human with single agent DNA PK inhibitors. That's really reassuring to hear. Um, so, Dr. Chohan, there were a couple questions about PR, uh, alpha PRT, um, and I know you had it on your roadmap. So, of course, with all these right. other um, trials that you have, how does alpha PRT fit in? Um, this person also wanted to thank you for the clarity of your presentation. And there was a second question that was related to this about if you could comment on the status of alpha too while you're answering this. Right. I think there is a lot of uh, buzz positive buzz about alpha PRRT uh, and I um, you know so far I've personally not have had any experience but based on my reading on alpha PRRT sounds very promising um, again the target is still the same somatostatin receptors at least in nets right um, but the form of radiation is little different for example with lutathera it's beta libo gamma with alpha PRT is alpha radiation. So for common folks, see, I'm not a nuclear physicist or nuclear medicine guy, but for us common folks, what alpha PRT means is it's a little bit higher energy radiation, okay? And, uh, you know, it tends not to disturb the nearby tissue, normal tissue. It, it has good penetration in the tumor, but not, and that's, that's the exciting aspect of alpha PRT. Now, is it better than the standard PRT? We don't have randomized data for that. Alpha PRT is currently being investigated. Uh, sounds promising, but we are looking for more data. I think Dr. Del Passan's group in Houston is testing some alpha PRRT agents. They also published a little bit of data from their earlier phase one cohort. So certainly seems very exciting agent, exciting agent in terms of uh, administering a novel form of radiation to net patients. However, how good is it in terms of uh, short and long-term safety, effectiveness, we are awaiting to see some of these clinical trials to read out. 
See, with BRRT and Ludothera, sorry, Ludothera BRRT, we have a really good, robust data on effectiveness, both short-term and long-term. And, and we can say with confidence, this is, this is our success rate, or this is the weakness, right? So we are trying to learn that about these other novel radiopharmaceutical agents. So it's, it's really promising. It looks very exciting. I personally also would like to, um, you know, open certain PRT, alpha PRT studies uh, if given opportunities. Of course, you know, these studies are not easy to do. You have to have certain logistical support. So that's why, uh, you know, not very place, many places would have it. Uh, but we'll try to get an alpha PRT program in University of Kentucky so that patients in our region can also benefit from these. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, this is promising up and coming, but I'm eager to await the long-term data and the bigger tries to read out. Thank you for that. And uh, this person and other others in the audience may already know that Dr. De Delpasan was our speaker in March, so you can go back and watch that webinar. And Dr. Boudet also, also talked about PRT um, in general and, and much of the data uh, across the field and the new trials that are out. Um, so you can go back and watch April's webinar as well. Um, another question about PRT, um, well, I've, there's three questions here, but could you please share what the treatment options after four cycles of PRT? So can it be repeated? Um, and what are the options of getting into combo trials if they uh, progressed? Right. So great question. And I think this is going to be a problem that we would be incurring more and more in the near future. PRT is now, um, you know, there it's a reality and it's one of a very active uh, and important drug in our management for net patients but despite it working so well eventually most patients would still progress that can happen 30 months 50 months 60 months nobody knows but eventually most patients will show progression and as the time elapses, uh, we will see some of these priority progressing patients in near future so broadly we like to classify the patients into two subgroups and how we make those specific definitions st still being debated but broadly there would be two groups one group is those patients who had tremendous benefit from prt and had disease stabilization after prt for a long period of time uh, for ease of discussion, let's put that long period of time as 12 months. So if patients who got four doses of PRRT and the tumors were stable at least for a year after, I would call them that these are PRRT responders, durable responders. You know, it could be even two years, three years or four years after PRRT and they, they had stable disease. So these are the patients where PRRT works so well in the first round that it is obvious that if the tumor came back or started growing two or three years later, that this patient would like to try again, right? It is only intuitive. Um, and we unfortunately do not have prospective data. That means we haven't studied it in a clinical trial that patients who have done PRRT, when we retreat them with PRRT, is it as effective as like the first round? And is it as safe as the first round? So we don't have that prospective data. But fortunately, we have a lot of retrospective data. I personally looked into this question and there are about 13 studies uh, done on this from various centers in Europe where patients were retreated with PRRT. And it shows that the PRRT is still active when repeated. So the data suggests that when we repeat PRT, the median PFS can vary from 12 months to all the way 22 months. So the, the, the drug clearly has activity, um, you know, when repeated in future in those who benefited from PRT at the first round. It also seems based on this retrospective data that it is relatively safe that there wasn't a considerable added risk, but of course, more the radiation exposure, we worry about some of those bone marrow side effects and secondary cancers, et cetera. So uh, we have to be very cautious. 
Now, the flip side is these retrospective studies are not the cleanest data, unfortunately, right? So what is retrospective means? That patients were treated and now we go back into their records and we look how they did. So they weren't done treated with an intention of studying these. So there is a lot of bias. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, patients who might not be fit were treated. The only fit patients were treated. So there's a lot of bias there. So it might not be the most accurate data. Okay. So the short answer is yes, there is some data to suggest that in patients who benefited from first round of PRT can benefit again uh, and it can be safely done. And I would not advise full four doses and repeat in certain European centers, repeat dose with two uh, lute additional lutathera have been done. Uh, in some centers, they reduce the dose from 200 millicurie to 100 millicurie and then give them four fractions. But uh, I think the common practice is to do full dose 200 millicurie times two. Again, this is something that we really need to study prospectively. And we are currently working on it, Lisa. Next time we talk, hopefully I can give you some good news that we have a clinical trial for repeat PRRT uh, throughout the US. So we are working hard on that because we really need to generate this prospective data, one, to, for the safety of our patients, because right now we're going by very small retrospective studies. Before I prescribe any to my patients, I have to be first sure that, okay, it's not hurting them. Second, it's also going to help us uh, generate new guidelines and evidence so that the insurance, which might come back and say, hey, PRT is only approved for four doses, then we can at least go back to them and say, we have strong data to support that to repeat PRT in those patients who benefited in the first round, it can help them. So, so we are working towards that. Hopefully we can start this important clinical trial soon. That sounds really exciting. Um, and what about the options of getting into one of the combo trial after that progression, after the initial four, four cycles? Right. So unfortunately, right now, the way we have designed these um, combination studies, we have excluded prior exposure to PRRT. As you can uh, understand that these are first in human combination studies. So we have to be extremely cautious in, in kind of generating this combination safety data. So anybody who has previously been exposed to a certain degree of radiation, technically and theoretically, there is a little bit higher risk for radiation related side effects. So we, you know, as I mentioned again and again, the theme is patient safety first. We try to, uh, you know, um, not include the patients which can potentially develop more radiation-based side effects. It is done keeping patients' interest in mind, not to kind of make patients not benefit from these com uh, combination studies. Now, in future, if we are able to show that these combination studies are completely safe, then you're absolutely right, Lisa. The next step would be to try these combination in PRRT refractory patients because that's where the real need is, that the patients who have not responded to PRT, can we make them respond to PRT by adding radiation sensitization? It's going to be a sequential process. Hopefully we can come to that point in the near future. We hope so, thank you for that. Um, and speaking of safety, you know, uh, really, uh, interesting talk about the serotonin and the telochistat study. So this person had a really interesting question. Should patients stop taking SSRIs since serotonin affects net growth? Um, the short answer is no, please don't stop taking SSRIs. Um, this was a very tricky question because you know, the history of serotonin and NETs um, and how it works. So many patients would ask, uh, how does serotonin affect uh, NETS growth, et cetera, and an effect on their mood and antidepressants and all those things. Fortunately, our experience and also small published data from Dana-Farber suggests that SSRIs doesn't affect serotonin to a level, at least in net tumors, to cause any meaningful detrimental effect. 
fortunately, all of these things, the SSRI related uh, antidepressant effects happening within the confines of blood brain barrier in the brain. So the systemic circulation and the effects on the peripheral nets is my understanding is, is uh, not being affected. Um, so I would advise patients who are on SSRIs to continue it based on their uh, doctor's advice. It, currently we do not have convincing data that it affects uh, nets in any detrimental way Cancer patients very well known because of the added stressors. You know, this is a chronic disease. Uh, takes a toll on, uh, you know, the mental health and, and stress is really bad, um, you know, and, and it's really important for a patient to make sure that their uh, mental health uh, issues, be it anxiety, depression, is well taken care of. And SSRI is a very important tool for us to kind of help uh, with that. So I would not advise and I would reassure that we currently we do not have any data that using SSRIs make tumors go faster or make them worse. So please don't worry about it. And if, if we learn something of that sort, which we should have learned by now because SSRI is very common, we would have known and we will definitely let our patient community know. But right now we don't have any data to suggest that. This so so this all is happening. The brain stuff is happening in brain, and brains protected by blood brain barrier, and the carcinoid syndrome stuff is happening outside in the peripheral circulation, and they don't really affect each other. A simple answer. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Um, I know we're running over, so I just want to make sure that you're okay. If we keep going, okay. Um, I'm completely. I, <laughs> there's still a lot of <laughs> questions left. Um, but we'll, we'll take some more. Um, you mentioned the telotus ethyl study is for those with excess serotonin production, so functional tumors. What about those with non-functional tumors? Um, actually, I'd like to uh, correct if I misspoke in the, the presentation. Telotus ethyl study is not only for functional tumors, but for all comers. Um, because our primary endpoint is not carcinoma syndrome, diarrhea control, but tumor control. We believe within the net cells, and this is based on our pre uh, on some of the published preclinical data on net models, tumor models, that serotonin um, level is a tumor promoter. And by inhibiting serotonin, that we can inhibit the tumor growth, right? Now, the non-functional net, nets might not release excess serotonin to a point where they cause carcinoma syndrome, but they certainly have at microscopic level, they do have this process intact that they can secrete or in the local milieu in, in the tumor microenvironment to increase or promote the net cell growth. And that's what we are trying to target, not the functional syndrome. So patients with no detectable peripheral serotonin uh, can also potentially benefit from uh, this process. We are trying to target serotonin in the tumor cells uh, because we believe that that very little bit of serotonin within the tumor cells in the microenvironment does promote tumor growth. And that's our central hypothesis behind this. So it, it, the study is not just for carcinoma syndrome patients, but it is for all comers. That's great, even more options. Um... Thank you for that. Um, there's several questions about um, about neuroendocrine high grade, of course. And as you mentioned, you know this talk was mostly focused on low to mid grade. Um, but um, this person was asking if you ever treated patients with a transitional variant of the disease from low grade, low to intermediate net to high grade NEC. Right. Um, I've had uh, some patients where we had to, uh, you know we had to manage patients with this type of situation where initially the patient primary disease burden was either NEC and later uh, it was NET and then vice versa, it was NET and then NEC. Uh, my belief is that some of the patients have heterogeneous disease 
that there is component of both low and high grade in certain cases. And when we treat, for example, high grade component with chemotherapy, and sometimes there's high grade component so sensitive to chemotherapy that it gets uh, destroyed and the residual disease is low grade. And, and so we can't really say that it transitioned from high grade to low grade. Uh, it probably was always there to begin with. Now, within NET, I have seen that the tumors can move from grade two to grade three or grade one to grade two. Um, and that phenomena is known and it can happen. As a common rule, most of the time, NETs and its grade does not change. So if somebody has been diagnosed with grade one NET, um, even at progression, they tend to remain the same tumor what they began with, the grade one and ET. If it's grade two, it stays as grade two. But there have been few cases, and we know that this can happen, that the tumor becoming a little more aggressive, they, they develop more mutations as they get more, uh, as they progresses under the stressors of various treatments. Uh, they can develop a little bit more aggressive biology and change their grade and become a higher grade from lower grade, okay? But to change the morphology altogether from a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor to a poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, which are large cells and small cells, that's usually uh, not a common thing. But as I mentioned, that we have seen patients who were diagnosed with both well-differentiated and poorly differentiated component. They probably presented with both. And then, you know, one of the disease was a little bit more overwhelming. So we were focusing on that versus the other. Uh, in certain scenarios, uh, for example, prostate, this is a very well known that prostate adenocarcinoma, which is the more common type of prostate cancer, under certain stressors can morph into high-grade neuroendocrine cancer of prostate, which is small cell prostate cancer. And the pathophysiology of that is very well known, how, what changes happen, what mutations makes those things, and it's been very well uh, published. In other high-grade neuroendocrine cancers, we don't know, uh, you know, if it is a true phenomena that nets convert into high-grade poorly differentiated, and if they do, what really happens which makes them change or make that flip so i'm still skeptical but we do come across cases where they were first diagnosed with net and now with nec so i'm not sure is it truly a transformation or they always have both to begin with or you know what happens there so it's still an mm. evolving side. thank you so much for that um and you know this question comes up quite frequently, is there any prospect for using PRT for treatment of high-grade um, neuroendocrine carcinoma with a high KI-67? Right, that's a great question. There is some data to suggest that even high-grade neuroendocrine cancers can express somatostatin receptors. Uh, that percentage population is smaller for sure as compared to low-grade NADs. But if the patient has very high uptake of uh, somatostatin receptor, uh, you know, on uh, let's suppose gallium scan or detect NAT scan, then clearly those patients can be very good uh, candidate for PRRT. At Markey, we are studying this. Uh, we are trying to studying, study the prevalence of somatostatin receptors in high-grade neuroendocrine cancers. And if uh, we see promising results, I think it's worthwhile to develop a protocol or a clinical trial targeting high grades with PRRT. I also know that there are certain clinical trials. I think there is a clinical trial in Canada, which is looking into high grade neuroendocrine cancers with PRRT. So PRRT works wherever there is a target. If there is a target in high grades, then a case can be made that patients can be treated. Unfortunately, right now we don't have many clinical trials looking into it, but should be certainly looked into. This is an area of critical unmet need. We need new therapies. Some of the examples, for uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you beyond NATS where uh, somatostatin receptors are there. 
uh, for example, Merkel cell. Merkel cell cancer is a type of skin cancer, is sort of high grade neuroendocrine cancer, and uh, sometimes can express very high somatosine receptors. And there are published one or two cases, one from India mm -hmm. and another from the which showed partial response and even complete response to PRRT. So if a tumor has somatosine receptor, regardless of the tumor, I think PRRT can work, but it really needs to be looked in in a formal clinical trial. So we don't do these uh, one-off off-label studies. We really wanna study them properly so that future generation of patients can also benefit from this experience and it is safer to do under clinical trial protocol. Thank you for that. That's really um, very clear and exciting that it can be used for other things. So, you know, this is a little bit more specific to this person, but um, also general, like what does it mean when metastatic high-grade neuroendocrine uh, pancreatic carcinoma has high serotonin and the chromogranulin A is within normal range? And I think this is outside of, you know, your talk, but you're, you're an oncologist, so, you know, this, this happens is, a lot. No, this is a great question. So right off the bat, chromogranin A is not an accurate biomarker. And that's why we oncologists have a love-hate relationship with chromogranin A. Many patients would come up with high chromogranin, have had no disease, and it really freaks them out. And then they are worried because there are a lot of things in the body which can upregulate chromogranin A, something as trivial as taking an antacid, like a proton pump inhibitor. Similarly, on the contrary, sometimes patient can have big burden of disease and the chromogranin A is not reflecting that and it is low. So again, it's not a very accurate test and I, I don't put too much money into uh, chromogranin A. The best way to monitor the disease is scans, CT or MRI scans. That's the most accurate way to know what's really happening with the tumors, are they shrinking or growing? So a normal or low chromogranin A uh, is not very helpful. Secondly, specific to this patient scenario, chromogranin is a little bit better test to be done in low grade nets. As the grade of neuroendocrine cancer increases, the sensitivity and specificity of chromogranin A reduces even more. So it's not a good test to begin with, but in high grade neuroendocrine cancers, it's even a worse test to do. Sometimes I do neuron specific enolase in high grade neuroendocrine cancers, uh, and it can be elevated in certain high grade neuroendocrine cancers. And if it is, then I monitor that for disease uh, uh, burden. But chromogranin A in high grades, I don't routinely monitor. It's not as sensitive as it is in low grade nets. So it's not very surprising to me that chromogranin is within normal. Um, and if the, this particular patient has high serotonin, that, that is a good biomarker to then monitor. Because serotonin, you wanna, you wanna try to always strive to lower the serotonin for two purposes. One is if the serotonin is giving the patient symptoms, be it flushing, diarrhea, fatigue, wheezing, then we need to lower that serotonin to get rid of those symptoms. And by monitoring how much the serotonin is trending down, it really helps us uh, fine tune our treatments, right? So if, we're, if, we, if the symptoms are getting better, but the serotonin is still very, very elevated, then we need to do further better uh, because it can also have detrimental effects on uh, heart, carcinoma, heart disease, mesenteric fibrosis, and other things. But secondly, we also know a uh, high level of serotonin uh, in functional net patient, uh, you know, the patient seems to have worse outcome. Patients who have really high serotonin levels uh, in some of the published literature, the overall, uh, you know, survival was uh, much worse as compared to those patients with the serotonin is well controlled. So, you know, and this is probably because of the complications and side effects that happens with high serotonin. So, if somebody has high serotonin, that's a good biomarker to monitor uh, during the disease course. But chromogranin A, take it with the big chunk of salt. Yeah, and as you said, you know, that's why you're working on other biomarkers, right? To, to see if we can find yeah. something better. Absolutely, yeah, we, we are very excited about the new novel biomarker called progastrin. It is very early, uh, you know, but 
at least based uh, we we tested in 93 patient samples spanning across low grade and high grades and we compared it to almost close to three to four hundred normal non-cancer patients and we found a statistically significant elevation uh, so this seems to be elevated in neuroendocrine tumors and NECs. We also have another really interesting biomarkers. Uh, the NET test seems to be very accurate. It's a blood-based biomarker in detecting neuroendocrine tumors and monitoring the disease. I personally don't have a lot of experience with it, but the published data on NET test seems very promising and very strong. So I'm glad that the science in NETs and NEC is not only moving in therapy space, but also in detection space and the diagnostic space. So all great news for our patients. Thank you. And I know the net test comes up a lot. So thanks for covering that. Um, so, you know, again, a couple other uh, high grade questions. If there's progression on first line of tazolizumab immunotherapy, um, particularly in metastatic high grade PNET, um, can another immunotherapy treatment be used as second line? Right. So again, the disclaimer here is that it's very difficult to answer very specific patient related question. But let me rephrase as a general scenario. Let's suppose that somebody with immunotherapy exposure in high grade NECs, can, can they or should they get more immunotherapy, maybe a doublet in future? So the answer is not easy. There are a couple of things that I personally look into before doing that. Um, how long the patient was on single agent immunotherapy. So if somebody benefited from single agent immunotherapy like a tezolizumab for a long period of time, like a year or eight months, nine months, a year, year and a half, that, that tells me that their tumor was immunogenic to begin with and really benefited from it. And then now the immune system stopped responding to immunotherapy is it a, there's a potential that these patients can be uh, resensitized. Even in this scenario, I give them a little break from immunotherapy, uh, let their immune system kind of reconstitute, and I use chemotherapy as second line or third line. And then in future, if they stop responding to chemotherapy, that's when I reintroduce immunotherapy, and I've had some success in, in that sense. Uh, so a good response to immunotherapy is a good way to identify patients who might respond to a doublet in the near future. Other things that I look into a tumor which might help me uh, tease out the, this particular patient population who might benefit from doublet is tumor mutation burden. Um, and, and patients with intermediate or high tumor mutation burden tend to seem to also benefit from immunotherapy. But on the contrary, if I have a patient who comes to me and progressed on single agent tezolizumab, really didn't benefit a whole lot from a tezolizumab, just one or two rounds and then progressed, um, I would probably, and has low tumor mutation burden, I would probably avoid jumping to another immunotherapy or doublet right away. Um, uh, there are probably better options in chemotherapy, which um, probably has a higher success rate um, in salvage setting in high grades. Now, can we re-challenge after that with a doublet? It is a question mark. Uh, if patient didn't benefit from the first time and has low tumor mutation burden, I would be a little cautious. So we have to discuss and look into individual patient. If the patient is fit, very healthy, there is no visceral crisis, the cancer is not growing at a very rapid pace, immunotherapy can be tried. We have some really good data with the doublet immunotherapy from SWOG study. Um, there is some retrospective data from non-clinical trials, which weren't very promising, but from SWOG study, which is a prospective multicenter study, did show some promising data in the small study uh, with the doublet. So again, we have to discuss and, and cater to that individual patient based on that particular uh, need of the R, how fast the tumors are growing, do we have time to treat with immunotherapy? Even if immunotherapy works, it takes four to six weeks to see that effect. It's a slow type of anti-tumor drug, uh, unlike chemotherapy, uh, which we prefer if the patient's having rapid progression, visceral crisis, a lot of pain, a lot of tumor growth, and 
we need immediate relief, chemotherapy is a little bit more faster in, in terms of seeing the benefits. So we have to really tailor the treatment based on that individual patient need. Everything's tailored. We are all zebras. Thank you for that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, yep. Yeah. And here's another question that may be a little specific too, but um, what treatment for small cell nasal uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma with bone mets, again, with a high KI-67, such as 85%, would you consider appropriate? Right. So great question. Small cell carcinoma is a subtype of high-grade neuroendocrine cancer, and it can happen in many parts of the body, right? The commonest, by far the commonest place where it happens is lung. In fact, 15 to 18% of all lung cancers are small cell lung cancers. So it is a big or a common type of cancer in lung. But outside lung, extra thoracic small cell carcinomas are exceptionally rare. It's not very common. I would say one in 100,000 patients would have extra thoracic small cell carcinoma. But I have treated and because most of my practice 50% uh, of my practice is low-grade nets and other 50% high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. So see, I see a lot of high-grade neuroendocrine cancer. And I've seen small cell carcinoma in parotid, head and neck, throat, pancreas, gallbladder, uh, you name it. So it can happen anywhere in the body. But largely, the principles of treatment follow small cell lung cancer. Why? Because that's where the best uh, data comes from. Small cell lung cancer being a more common type of cancer, most treatment therapy trials have been done in that space. So we use our experience from small cell lung cancer world and then try to, uh, you know, uh, project that or extrapolate that in extra thoracic small cell. So to answer this particular question, if I have a small cell of nasal cavity with bone mat, so this is clearly a metastatic disease, um, I would potentially consider a platinum-based chemotherapy to begin with. There can be a role of radiation for palliation, especially with the head and neck cancer. It could cause some certain significant symptoms because of the location of the tumor. These cancers are very radiation sensitive. So uh, radiation, on top of the platinum doublet can be considered for palliation of symptoms, but to control the disease everywhere in the body, uh, especially this is a metastatic disease, bone mats, I think uh, platinum-based chemotherapy is our go-to agent and has been for past uh, at least 20, 25 years. Now, after the platinum doublet, uh, the debate is on what should be done. In, in small cell lung cancer, we try certain chemotherapies. In extrathoracic, Small cell, again, uh, the agents which I prefer in this setting are irinotecan-based chemotherapies or clinical trials. I really advocate for clinical trials. As I mentioned before, we have a trial with ATR inhibitor in combination with topotecan that can be tried. We have a trial of carbozantinib with ipilimumab and nivolumab. That would be a really good trial in this setting. Uh, so it depends on what is our need of the hour. If we believe that the patient would benefit from second-line immunotherapy-based drugs, I try to steer them towards an appropriate immunotherapy clinical trial. If we believe that patient needs more urgent therapy, uh, a chemotherapy-based drug or a clinical trial would be more apt, so I steer them towards the ATR inhibitor, uh, topotecan clinical trial. But clinical trial in high-grade neuroendocrine cancer space are highly advocated for because we literally have no options or no thoroughly studied option once we fail platinum-based treatment. So, so that's what I, I really recommend and push for an appropriate clinical trial, which is tailored towards high-grade neuroendocrine cancer patients' needs. Thank you for that. I think that answer is very helpful. Um, and since you are <laughs> the, so familiar with high grade, um, as you know, many patients kind of struggle with this language, right? So um, this particular you know, person asks metastatic high grade PNET, so it's actually pancreatic carcinoma with features of the structure of the nuclei to the small cells, um, KI-67, 60 to 80%. What does this molecular structure mean? If you could bring some clarity. Right. 
So um, the terminology is a little bit confusing uh, regarding neuroendocrine cancers in general, and it is also evolving. However, I believe it's evolving for betterment, and now we have a more and more formal structured nomenclature. So just uh, to summarize for the entire audience, neuroendocrine cancers is a spectrum of disease. It's not just one disease. Uh, and if you look at it under a microscope, there are different gradings and different, uh, you know, aggressiveness. And that really depends on uh, how they look under the microscope. So broadly, neuroendocrine cancers can be categorized into two big groups, NET and NEC. Neuroendocrine tumor, the T being the main keyword here, and neuroendocrine carcinoma with C being the main word here. Okay, so it's NET or NEC. Now, how we differentiate this NET and NEC? Of course, I can't differentiate that. This, that's why we, we really need smart pathologists. And, and really, uh, the most important uh, critical thing during the management of neuroendocrine cancer patient is pathology. If we get the pathology wrong, everything's wrong. The diagnostic tests and the treatment we put the patients on, I cannot emphasize how important it is to get a good pathologic diagnosis. So the, the way these NET and NEC are classified, the WHO, World Health Organization, have a system uh, where all the opinion leaders and the pathologists come together and then they discuss and they, they set up rules and guidelines. This is how we'll define what is NET. This is how we define what is NEC. So and that, that parameters include how the cells look under the microscope, what stains it's pick up, how it looks as compared to this, this other cell. So there, there are all sort of things that they have mentioned. And of course, I'm not a trained pathologist, but there are these things, the size of this nucleus, the size of the cell altogether, uh, what, what kind of granules there are, the pattern of the growth of the cells. These are the, the necrosis, are there dead cells there or not? So these are all those things that what the pathologist does and, and kind of figures that out. Now, the NEC group, these are high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma group, they're also called poorly differentiated. Um, the main two subtypes of these are either large cell or small cell NEC, right? So they're both subtypes of neuroendocrine carcinoma NEC. One is small cell, another is large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. So small cell, the pathologist named it small cell because they looked like small round blue cells under the microscope. So they call them small cells, right? It doesn't mean they're less aggressive or they're smaller in stature in terms of aggressiveness. They are very aggressive. They're one of the most aggressive cancers that we know of. Uh, and, and large cell, just because, um, you know, they, they're much larger in appearance as compared to small cell. However, they're both in the NEC category because they have some commonalities. They are picking up certain stains which are very common to high-grade neuroendocrine cancers. Chromogranin, NSE, uh, you know, certain things, cyanoptophysin, this and that. So, so this is how they know this is not a lymphoma or kidney cancer. This is a high-grade neuroendocrine cancer. And then when they go into the weeds, they further subclassify them into, oh, this is small cell carcinoma, or this is large cell carcinoma, but they're both kind of like sister cancers. They're both subtypes of high-grade neuroendocrine cancer, or NEC. On the other hand, the NET, they are well-differentiated. They look like neuroendocrine tumors, neuroendocrine cells, but they're, of course, excessively growing. They're not nor normal, they're tumorous. But based on the KI-67, we subclassify them to grade one, grade two, and grade three, okay? So if the KI-67 more than 20% is grade three. In NEC, they're all grade three. That means all NEC, regardless whether they're a small cell, they're a large cell, or they're poorly differentiated, they all have higher than KI-67. For example, this case in point, the patient here has small cell, which is KI-67, 60 to 80%. Many a times, small cell carcinoma might have KI-67 in 90%, 95%. So very fast dividing, very active cancer cells. So that's all it means. It is basically a medical jargon for pathologists and to figure out how to classify the cancer and where, what's the final diagnosis.
but it is the most important step in our management. I like to look anytime I see a patient, I get their pathology reviewed as long as we have access to their biopsy slide by our pathologist so that we know, are we dealing with grade one NET, grade two NET, grade three NET, or NEC? If I can even get finer details, is it a small cell NEC, or is it a large cell NEC, or is it a mixed type? Sometimes we see a mixed where there is adenocarcinoma mixed with NEC or a different type of tumor. So, so it's, it's, it's a good problem to have that we are now understanding all these different subtypes and consolidating the nomenclature. But of course, I also understand it can be a little bit overwhelming for patients. Mm -hmm. I hope that helps. Yeah, I hope it helps too. And this is very important. You know, it, it's the foundation, as you said, of how you're going to make the decisions. And this is why, as, as you know, Dr. Dan Lee at City of Hope, myself, Giovanna, created Net Vitals. And this is on the very first section of Net Vitals, you know, to know what grade, what KI-67, so that when we walk into your office or Dr. Dan Lee or whoever it is, we already have that and the pathology report so that you can make help us make a better decision. So thank you for that. Um, so I, you know, I guess we asked all these questions about treatments and nomenclature because ultimately we want to know what the hope is. So what is the long-term responses you might see in high grade neuroendocrine carcinoma? Right, right. Um, so historically the high grade NEC both small cell and large cell NEC, once they are metastatic, the outcomes are not very good and not, they're unlike what we see for NET. So the median survivals, unfortunately, are not uh, good. To, to give you an example, because small cell lung cancer is the most common type of high grade NEC, and we have studied it the best and we have the most reliable data on it, the five-year survival for small cell lung cancer, metastatic extensive stage small cell lung cancer is less than 2%. That tells you how aggressive this cancer is, right? Now, I'm not saying that small cell cancer of pancreas is also similar, but the other extra thoracic small cell carcinoma are so rare that we don't really have reliable data on long-term outcome, but it somewhat mirrors uh, the small cell lung cancer data. Now, there has been some advancements with the, with the incorporation of immunotherapy in high-grade space, especially in small cell lung cancer, it's a standard of care, and we have seen some improvement in overall survival. However, it is a modest improvement. There is still a whole lot that we need to do to go and improve it in a meaningful way. Now, uh, you know, the, the responses in high-grade neuronal cancers can vary drastically based on if the treatment works or not. I personally, for example, have a, had a patient, small cell carcinoma, who had stable disease after stop responding on irinotec and just irinotec and for a whole year. So, so we sometimes see that. I've had patients on immunotherapy, couple of patients now on immunotherapy going on their third and fourth year. Um, and in fact, they're off the treatment altogether now uh, with no evidence of disease. So sometimes we do see these really, really dramatic effects. Uh, and these are called exceptional responders, right? So I would caution the audience here that this should not be considered a general rule, but it is always very, uh, you know, good to know that certain patients can benefit in such a dramatic way. And we'd like to learn from these experiences and build on it and see if, if we can replicate in more of our patients. So, so yes, I do have patients with long-term durable responses with immunotherapy-based treatments, uh, especially, um, but this is a very, very minor subset. And I wish that we can replicate the success in more patients. And for that, we, we are hopefully some of these next generation of clinical trials that we are currently planning that would, be, would answer to these issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the clinical trials are very important all across the board and especially in this high grade population. Um, and you've been so incredibly generous with your time. So let's just end with this last question. What's your biggest hope for the neuroendocrine cancer community and any other closing words that you have? Right. So I think um, neuroendocrine cancer community is very special. 
there is a camaraderie and and a longing for knowledge and and networking in this community that i sense i might be biased because uh, i like my neuroendocrine community but i have noticed that there 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 is you know a sense of uh, finding information and networking and seeking out help in net patient community and the caregivers so the patient advocacy groups are across the country are doing great jobs and i've also seen some of them across uh, the you know the, the seven seas in different countries india and europe doing uh, fantastic jobs uh, so so this i think is fantastic and what has that done is that has really helped us create a little bit more uh, you know awareness about this condition this is a rare cancer otherwise and otherwise we get hidden and and because it being a rare cancer we haven't really seen a lot of progress in and diagnostic and therapeutics for a long time fortunately because of tall leaders in our group and because of the efforts by patient advocacy groups and the patients themselves and awareness they have generated we have now stepped on to the gas and things are moving faster in the last 5 to 7 years but there's a whole lot that needs to be done we can only achieve that by creating awareness about this cancer so so spread awareness about this cancer talk to people make them aware that uh, not all tumors in pancreas are pancreatic cancers there are something called a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors which is different than pancreatic cancer so so things like those uh, that we need to generate awareness once we generate awareness then people understand the burden of the disease there is a growing burden of this cancer in the country and globally which needs to be catered to once people understand the burden of disease then the next step is to fight it right and and uh, and uh, you know and i really appreciate everybody here and opportunity by lackness to kind of help me voice some of those opinions but i'm sure you you probably agree with me there that i think uh, the hope is finding new treatments through clinical trials raising awareness about our disease type and and uh, awareness also leads to mm-hmm. uh, funding which helps us uh, researchers do our work also generate some momentum from federal agencies like nci uh, etc to help fund some of these research work so yes uh, i think i'm very optimistic uh, we have a lot of new young investigators also jumping on the field and who are seeing uh, a promising career in this area so mm-hmm. happy as well so the future is bright i'm very optimistic yeah yes so awareness brings more understanding brings more fight which brings more hope thank Absolutely. you so much thank you for all that you're doing for all your time thanks for sharing the latest and the greatest in clinical trials and thank you on behalf of the whole community for all your efforts for your passion care and for all your hope for all of us we really need that and we really appreciate it thank you thank so you much thank you so much i appreciate it and and i'm going to give it back to you in the studio now lindsay take it away thank you lisa as a reminder be sure you're following lacknuts on social media we have facebook twitter and instagram you can stay up to date on all net news and upcoming events today's webinar is being recorded and can be viewed shortly after the live broadcast on our youtube channel you can find that at bitly slash lacknuts youtube now back to you lisa Thank you, Lindsay. We understand that these may be challenging times, and we offer many programs and resources, including our weekly NET support group, our monthly NET caregiver-only support group, NET Vitals, which is a downloadable patient-physician communication tool to help you prepare for your medical appointments, and health coaching that is available to either NET patients or caregivers. We encourage you to go to our website to find out more information about our programs, view resources, read blogs, Take the net quizzes to check your understanding of all the information you're learning and much, much more. Our virtual 2021 LA Net Patient Education Conference is just one month away. Please join us on June 19th for our half day conference featuring an incredible lineup of speakers on various topics, inspiring patient stories and a live Q&A. We're excited to share that we've confirmed the rest of our speakers for 2021. In July, Dr. Eric Liu will be giving a talk called It's a Marathon, Not a Sprint. In August, Dr. Chandri Krasakaran from University of Iowa will be presenting Treatment Selection and Sequencing in Nets. 
In September, Dr. Robert Ramirez, who's now at Vanderbilt University, will join us to discuss lung nets. In October, we are pleased to have the CEO of the nonprofit Triage Cancer join us just in time to cover navigating health and disability insurance. Our November Net Cancer Day Symposium will focus on patient advocacy and include guest speakers, patient advocates Josh Mailman and Cindy Lovelace, as well as patient physician Dr. Mark Lewis. And in December, we'll wrap up the year with Chaplain Michael Echelon, who will join us again to give an inspirational talk. Thanks again to our speaker, Dr. Chohan, for your excellent presentation. We're so grateful for your passion and your drive to help the NET community. Thank you also to Rich from TVP Live, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. We're excited to see you next month for our virtual 2021 Los Angeles NET Patient Education Conference. Bye. Bye. Thank you.